Let's just give Jesus one more big shout out in a moment. <laughs> yes. And I'd love us to do it again, but just before we do, um, I just thought maybe we could get that call. No. <laughs> there could be someone that you're supposed to invite for tonight, by the way. Hey, are the meetings open tonight? The evangelist in me is, uh, really has a prophetic word for everyone. You should invite someone tonight. You should get on your phone and talk to someone at the coffee shop today and get someone here tonight. Last night was very, very powerful. We saw healings. Uh, there was a word for someone like a lost sheep. I was weeping over there and came forward and gave their life to Jesus, reconnected with Jesus. And that's, that's just, I believe, just a couple of drops in comparison to what's going to happen this week. So let's all be evangelists today, amen? In fact, let's just be Christians, as the evangelist would tell us. It's for everyone, right? It's for all the saints. Are you a saint? Well, then put, say to the person next to you, are you a saint? Ask them. And uh, hopefully they say yes. If you're a believer, you are a saint because you've been made holy by the blood of Jesus. Um, the Roman Catholics in some circles would have us believe that you have to be dead first and do a certain amount of miracles and go through this whole process of being um, approved as being a saint. As much as I love my Catholic brothers and sisters, but in that case, they are definitely wrong, aren't they? We're the saints. Born again believers are saints. When you got born again, you became a saint. So one more time, we're going to give it up for Jesus. And I just want you to think about the victory that we have in Christ just before you let rip with a joyful noise under God with high praises. This is not a hype thing when we praise. It's not hype. It's not just hype. It's not just excitement, although it's exciting. It's way deeper. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I've honestly seen in moments of, of high praise, people being delivered of demonic spirits, healing breaking out without anyone laying hands because high praises are being lifted up to God. The Bible says that God actually is enthroned upon the praises of his people. He inhabits the praises of his people. Uh, out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. So often the sound of praise indicates where our hearts are. I actually believe the volume level has a little bit to do with that too. If, you're, if you know you're victorious in Christ, then what does it sound like to be around believers that know who they are, that know that Jesus took back the keys of sin and death, that we have victory, that we've just gone through Easter, He died, rose again on the third day, resurrection power, and now that power lives in us. What does that sound like? It doesn't sound like we're at a golf club with little golf claps. No way. Um, it's wild. It's wild. And I think many of us, we've got to let the wildness out. The Bible says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom, freedom, freedom. And that's why I love how we start meetings with worship and praise. I think about Jehoshaphat's army in 2 Chronicles, I think it's chapter 20, and it talks about the worshippers, the musicians going out on the front line. And enemies were encamped all around. They were outnumbered. They were flanked from every direction, but they had faith that God would deliver them. Amen? And so the worshippers went out on the front line, which in a military, practical, tactical sense, that doesn't make sense, but to God it does. And they went up and lifted up their praises, and I'm pretty sure they sang towards God about the beauty of His holiness. And they just began to sing about the beauty of God's holiness. And then God responded, and they got the victory. And God ended up setting up an ambush from memory, and the enemies ended up attacking one another instead of God's people. Because demons are stupid, and they ended up attacking each other. Amen? Because our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, wickedness in the heavenly realm. So what we do every time we play a note or we worship or we lift up high praises, let all the earth make a joyful noise unto God, every time we do that, it's actually spiritual warfare as well. And um, I've seen people delivered of like decades of depression and they've been on like heavy, heavy medication 
for decades because they haven't been able to deal with depression. But then they got a hold of this principle about high praise. Put on the garment of praise. Remember it says that in Isaiah? The garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. So that shows us that we are indeed in a spiritual battle. That heaviness, it's a spiritual thing. And we can break through that. Heaviness has nothing on us, man. Depression has nothing on us as believers. We can feel it, but it's not who we are. We can be tempted to yield to it, but it's not who we are. We're free. We're born again. We're blood-bought saints. And high praises and putting on the garment of praise is actually a way that we can combat the enemy. What about in Psalms where it says, let the high praises of God be in your mouth. And in that very same sentence, or in that same verse, I should say, it goes on to say, and a two-edged sword in your hand. So God wants us to understand that parallel, doesn't he? High praise equates to warfare. And what an awesome way to fight the enemy is to love God. That's why the Bible says not just resist the devil, because we know if we resist the devil, he'll flee, but it's not just that, is it? It's first submit to God and resist the devil and he'll flee. If you're just always resisting the enemy and your focus is always on him, you'll become who you behold. You'll be depressed. And, but if you're beholding God, by doing that, you're actually resisting the devil. Anyway, so I say all that to build faith because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Let's just let rip one more time with high praises and whatever that looks like for you. It could be words of affection and affirmation. It could be wild sounds of joy and praise. But I want to encourage you. I believe there is actually some people in here and you've been struggling with heaviness um, through circumstances. I even believe there's a number of leaders in here and there's been a lot of pressure of late in certain areas and the enemy's been throwing curveballs at you and you've just felt like a weighty heaviness, but it's not a good weight. The Bible says that the weight of God, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Amen. The only heavy weight we want is the kabod, the glory, not, not the enemy's burden. Amen. So let's as an act of spiritual warfare and also as an act of pure love under him, let's just let out our high praises and just keep going until you feel a release, until you feel to stop. You ready on the count of three? One, two, three. There's definitely more in us. You know, I believe that the enemy tries to lull, tries to lull some of us into believing that that expression is not for me. I'm more this way or I'm more that way. And although it's true to a degree, some of us are louder and more expressive than others by nature. Inwardly, all of us, instinctively, we have it in us to worship, to praise. Don't let the enemy lie to you. And often... Your flesh might not feel like it. Your soul might not feel like it. But we're not led of the flesh, nor are we led of the soul. We're grateful for the flesh, grateful for the soul. It's part of our human makeup. But sons and daughters of God are those that are led of the Spirit. And if you're someone right now that feels like, I, I just don't feel like doing this right now. You're the one that needs to get the breakthrough right now, actually, more than anyone. More than anyone. So let's just keep going a little longer. Let go. Let go. Some of you, you, 
you've needed a band to do this, but you don't need a band, you don't need a certain environment, you've got a mouth, open that mouth and just let out praise unto Him. Jesus! Hosanna in the highest! Ribe Basonde! Glory, 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 glory! Semba la bo, shaka la bo! Semba, semba, kore bare! Semba, semba, kore bare! Semba, semba, kore bare! Glory to God. Yeah, my spirit, there's an unction out of my spirit with that heavenly language. And I was interpreting it even as I was saying, Shemba, Shemba. My heart was saying, glory to God. Hosanna in the highest. I believe some of us need to allow that heavenly language to flow out again in these environments. Some of us are so worried about what Paul said in Corinthians, we never end up speaking in tongues as we think we have to have an interpreter every two seconds. Let me just bring an overall interpretation for what's happening right now. I want to encourage you to open up your mouth and let out that heavenly language right now. Speaking in tongues is one of the most attacked gifts in the body of Christ. You know why? Because it's one of the most powerful. Your spirit utters mysteries unto God, the Bible says. A beautiful heavenly language under Him. You know, you can praise and get breakthrough as you open up your mouth. And I believe God's going to even baptize people right now in the Holy Spirit again, fresh again, like in Acts chapter 4. God, fill us that we may speak Your Word with boldness, that You would stretch out Your hand to see the sick healed. That's it. Open up your mouth and let out that heavenly language. Shem bobo karabobo. You know, over the last three months, we've seen a lot of deliverance, a lot of people getting set free from demons, people that aren't necessarily possessed but oppressed because devils are freaking out right now. You know why? Because we are about to step into the greatest move of God that this earth has ever seen. Smith Wigglesworth prophesied it, Bob Jones, a number of prophets, and instinctively, Many of us in here, we're here, we've come to this gathering is because we know the time is now. And we want to position ourselves. I want to congratulate you for positioning yourself to receive, to be equipped, to be a part of the body of Christ, to take your rightful place. You know, think about in terms of the apostolic, I'm going to be covering this um, hopefully uh, soon. I say hopefully because who knows where God's going to take it. But uh, I think about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the famous one that many of us lean into and talk about in Acts chapter 2. We know that they were one accord, so we need unity, right? We know they were hungry, they were waiting, they were praying, they were seeking God, 120 in that upper room. But you know, before all of that took place, there was a re- structure. There was an apostolic restructure. Judas sadly betrayed Jesus and missed his place and his opportunity to be that founding stone, that foundation apostolic stone. And so there had to be a replacement, an apostolic replacement. And Matthias 
was chosen as the 12th apostle to replace Judas. And I believe that many are here because you want to take your rightful place. And I believe that when you take your rightful place, and we need discipleship, we need equipping before God can entrust us and empower us and ordain us into the ultimate call that God has for us. And I believe that prophetically many of us, God is, it's just before the Acts 2 for many of us. It's the resetting. It's people taking their rightful place. It's people saying, I want to let go of my life. I want to let go of all of the distractions. I don't want to be entangled again with this, the things of this world. I want to be fully given over to the purposes of God. I want to be possessed with Him. I believe prophetically that we are in that season at the moment where God's setting things up. People are taking their rightful positions, laying the foundation for what God is about to do, this last end time outpouring, an outpouring like we have never seen before. And I believe that God is gonna speak to many of you in these next three or four days and position you and prepare you and lead you, disciple you to take your rightful place so that God can pour out that new wine. And so what I have been seeing over the last three months in particular, an increase in deliverance. We've always seen deliverance in meetings, but there has been an emphasis. The Holy Spirit has been emphasizing deliverance. And I believe it's because God's trying to clean things up. Even with pastors and leaders, not possessed, but oppressed. Hooks in the soul, in the mind. And, uh, and I really believe that God is cleaning things up. Um, and the, at the same time, the enemy's freaking out because he knows his time is short. So there's an increase in darkness, in attack. And I believe there's people in here and you've been experiencing levels of demonic attack like you've never experienced before. Some of you have even felt like giving up because it's just too hard, it's too much. It's hitting multiple areas at the same time. It's even hitting your family in different areas. But I want to encourage you, the reason that this is happening, the reason that you're experiencing this new level of warfare is because you're about to step into and experience and be a part of the greatest move of God that you've ever seen. This is what we've all been hungering for and waiting for and speaking about. We've been waging a good warfare with prophecy. We've been leaning into it. We've been holding into it. We've been hooking our faith into it and saying, God, if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? Leo, Christine, thanks for having us back again. Last year was such a highlight for my year. I'm so grateful to be back. All the Nakotra family and all your team, your church. Get to hang out with some powerful ministers, meet some new people, and I'm uh, really grateful for it. Leo, I want to build upon um, last night, and we've got another session after this as well, which is awesome. Um, you talked about his word being a blueprint last night, and I'm just shouting out amen to that. We have to build upon this. And, you know, you, you also touched on Reformation last night, Leo, and why, what are we reforming? Reformation, you think of that word, and it, if you think about the definition, we're re. Forming. What are we reforming? Um, if you didn't hear last night's message, please get it because we're going to build upon that. But Leo, Leo talked about the dark ages. We're in the dark for a while. And a part of the reason it's termed the dark ages is because uh, we were deceived through the religious system of the day that this word was not for the common man like you and I. Only the supreme Chosen leaders were allowed to interpret and tell us what it means, their interpretation. And it was actually frowned upon for anyone to have a Bible. And I know my mum and dad, and in particular my dad, even in more modern times, um, he said he was brought up in, in a Catholic uh, family and he said it was very uncommon. And priests, even in his day in the, in the 70s, 
and 80s would look down upon anyone that would read the Bible unless they were studied under their system. And so Martin Luther, who did study under their system, he was famous in terms of what we understand now as the Reformation or the Protestant movement. Who's heard the word Protestant before? Who was here last night, by the way? Put your hand up if you were here last night. Awesome. If you weren't, please listen to that message because we're going to build upon it. We're laying the foundation with the fivefold, the apostolic, the understanding of that. But Protestant, um, so we understand, most people would probably understand that we have Catholics and Protestants. Okay, Within the Protestant banner, there's other multiple different denominations. But the word Protestant really means protest. And so during the Dark Ages, there were some people that stood up that studied under the Catholic system. Martin Luther, I'll use his, his life as a case example, very famous. But he recognized that what the religious system was teaching was not actually scriptural. So he was allowed to study the scriptures and he started to look at it and go, hang on a minute. This is not what God is saying. This is not God's heart. In particular, with key things like salvation. You know, they would teach that you, you would pay a certain amount of money to have your sins removed. Like really corrupt, twisted stuff. There's a whole lot of things that were just out of whack. And so Martin Luther really helped birth what we know now as the Reformation movement. We were reforming. We are getting the church back to the purity and as Leo said, the blueprint of the Word of God. There's some things that, even basic things like baptism and our understanding, the church understanding of baptism. And even still today, the, the Roman Catholic Church would have us believe, and if you're Roman Catholic and you're here, by the way, then um, I just want you to know that I work with Roman Catholics, so this is not, um, I'm not having a go at you, and there are awesome born-again believers and um, but I'm just picking on a few areas that are, are not scriptural. And to have reformation, we have to speak into it and we have to challenge one another according to the word of God. And so water baptism is another example of where some would have us believe that to be baptized, you, you, you become, you're a child and then there's a little sprinkle of water and that's a baptism. Now I would say that's more of a, a dedication and that's not a bad tradition to want to bring your family to church and dedicate your child unto God but ultimately baptism is for someone that's decided that they want to follow Jesus wholeheartedly and so to be a child and make that decision you sort of can but you really need to be of age to make that decision for yourself where your conscience is fully developed and you know the decision that you're making but even the Bible gives us the blueprint for baptism and the understanding and the definition of baptism is full immersion. Baptizo, the Greek word, full immersion. It's not a sprinkle of water, it's full immersion. And in fact, John the Baptist would actually travel a distance to ensure that he found enough water to be able to baptize fully and properly. That's how important it was to God because it's symbolic of our life, all of our life being washed away, dead, buried with Christ and coming up with newness of life. And unfortunately today, some of us are just living with the sprinkle of, of Jesus. But he wants us all in, all of our life washed away, come back with newness of life. And so as part of the Reformation, there was much debate, even on a subject like that. And then there's another character called um, John Calvin. And he stood up on Saints Day. Again, challenging the system, the religious system of the day. And he stood up on Saints Day and because they would pray to saints and it even become a form of idolatry where it was like we idolize Mary and the saints or the, you know, the, uh, the, the apostles that have gone before us. We, we pray to them and idolize them even before Jesus. That's where it was getting to. And so John Calvin stood up and said, and he quoted scripture reforming, bringing us back, challenging us, getting us back to the Word of God. And he said, there is one mediator between man and God, and that's not the Pope. We respect spiritual leaders, and we honor them, 
But they're supposed to point us to Jesus. They're not our mediator. They're not our advocate in the spiritual sense. Our advocate is Jesus. It, the Bible says in 1 John, if you sin, you have an advocate, Jesus Christ. So John Calvin did a lot of things right. And now we have Protestant, what they would term reformers, that would appreciate the work of John Calvin and even call themselves Calvinists. Has anyone heard of the term Calvinists? So I love what they did. I honor what they did. But here's the thing. The, the Reformation reforming shouldn't stop with John Calvin. And it continues today. As long as we're, we're, still, we're still growing in maturity, we don't look like even the, the Book of Acts church yet. So we're, we're reforming. We're getting things back to the blueprint, to the way it's supposed to be. And so the fivefold ministry, I believe God is highlighting that aspect of the Reformation right now in this season. And he wants us and the body of Christ to understand that. I've also discovered it's probably one of the most attacked areas right now. And it's, the attack is actually coming not from the world, but it's coming from our beloved brothers and sisters that were once a part of the Reformation and loved what John Calvin did, standing up and bringing us back to the Word of God. But they've stopped there and camped there, and now sadly they're attacking the other elements of Reformation that we need. Not all of them, but I can tell you quite a few. I don't know if you've experienced this, but as you continue to lean into this understanding of the fivefold ministry, operate in it, grow in it, you will be religiously attacked for it. So I think that you'll be attacked sometimes by well-meaning people that had just been taught a certain way, that the gifts of the Spirit, the fivefold ministry, those offices have ceased now. Um, they believe that now that we have the Bible, the canon scriptures, the 66 books, we don't need the gifts of the Spirit now. We don't need the fivefold officers or the apostles. We certainly don't need apostles because we have the scriptures now. That's pretty much, honestly, what their story is. So we can find common ground with a cessationist or a Calvinist. Often it's Calvinists that are cessationists. We can find common ground and say, we both believe that the scriptures, and hopefully all of us here, and Russ will certainly be um, ensuring that we, we're all on the same path here. The scriptures are indeed the perfect word of God. That every scripture from Genesis to Revelation is inspired by God. God breathed. Every jot and tittle it shall not pass away. There's warnings not to change it or take from it. So we can find common ground there. And then we really do need to be able to give an answer for why we believe what we believe. So that's why these settings and these conferences are so important. That's why I was making so many notes last night because not only do we want to see the correct blueprint in our ministries and churches, but we also want to be able to help others that have been taught wrong or that haven't continued on that Reformation journey. They stopped with one mediator between man and God or stopped with the understanding of water baptism or understanding of biblical presbytery or whatever it might be, they stopped there and haven't gone on to understand the importance of the fivefold ministry. And if you think about it, of course the enemy's going to try and kick against that because that's what brings maturity to the church. Because the enemy hates the idea of Christ being in all of us and all of us getting that revelation. Because that's the sort of army that God needs in this end time move. If we're going to see the billion soul harvest, it can't be any more just one man on a platform. He can only do so much. Even Jesus, I believe one of the reasons that he said you'll see greater things 
than what you've seen in my ministry in the 33 years. And in fact, it was only three years of public ministry. I believe that one of the reasons that he said you'll see greater things is because even Jesus, as fully man and fully God, he could only do so much in his flesh during three years. And it was phenomenal what he was able to do. And in fact, the Bible says that if there wouldn't be enough pages to contain all the marvelous works and things that Jesus did, but still yet he's limited. And so that's why not only was his mission to get to the cross, break down that wall that separated man, to get us back into relationship, to give us eternal life, all of those elements to the glorious gospel, but it was also to show us the system of discipleship the apostolic system of discipleship. And so he took 12 with him. We know there were other disciples as well, the 70 that he sent out. And there were often multitudes, thousands of people, but he had 12 that were close to him. And there was three years of intense discipleship. And I often get asked the question when when talking about, particularly about the apostolic, how do you know you're an apostle? Um, If I know that I'm called to that, how do I become an apostle? And really, it's all laid out so clearly here. But I think that case example of Jesus and the 12, we shouldn't be drifting too far from that. If you're called to a five-fold office, if you believe you're called to be an apostle or any of those other um, gifts, then you need to engage in a discipleship process. It's important that you get plugged in to a local church and it's important that maybe you're in leadership already but that you make steps to really yield yourself and really it's a form of humility to come under a leader and to be discipled and say, I want my life to be transparent. I want to learn scripturally but also I want to learn practically because Jesus was all about, the Jesus Supernatural School was all about the Word and the Spirit. There was demonstration. There was opportunity. That's what I love about your school and everything that you guys have been doing. It's so important that we set and create spaces for that. Discipleship is so important. And my heart in the apostolic is always discipleship. It's like, yes, we want to win the loss, but it's got to be about discipleship as well. Did you know that the word Christian is a great term that is an accurate term that describes us as believers, but that word can kind of get bandied around a little bit, can't it? Like a lot of people profess to be a Christian, but don't really understand what it is to be a Christian. Biblically speaking, that word is only used, I think, three or four times in the New Testament. You can study that out for yourself. It's not a wrong word, like Christ one, where believers are anointed and we're Christians. And I use that term to describe myself. But biblically speaking, to understand who we are and how we're supposed to live, a more accurate term to describe us should be disciple. And if you look at the Bible, you'll see that the word disciples used, depending on your translation, around 250 plus times so what's the difference between a professing christian and a disciple well have a think about the word disciple and immediately my mind goes to the word discipline if we want to become everything that god's calling us to be we can't just be a wandering christian we have to get planted discipled allow god to discipline us correct us grow us Uh, into maturity otherwise he's never going to entrust us to step into that ultimate purpose that he has for you there's a process and sometimes if particularly if you've got a a big call on your life sometimes the process is years and years and years it doesn't have to be that long i believe that three-year period if someone is fully going for it a hundred percent i believe three years is a good amount of time But sometimes God will take us the long way because character is something that he can't just drop on you. Character is formed. And it's often formed through hard times, through pressure, through struggles, 
through tribulation, through persecution, through uh, potential offense. And a lot of people start the journey and then they abort it because they got offended or something happened. But they didn't realize God's actually using that temptation to be offended to see how you'll handle it, to see if you'll be entrusted with the call in your life. He doesn't want you to keep being offended and go around the mountain for 40 years like they did in the Exodus, amen? So discipleship is uh, very, very, very important. And if I look at my life, the last 10 years I've been operating in the apostolic, but I've been saved for 20 years. The first 10 years was discipleship. It was growing into the apostolic. Maybe it should have been three years and maybe I was a little bit stubborn and God had to mold me and shape me for another seven years, but I'm glad he did. But the first 10 years, if I look back, I'm like, I didn't know that I was called into the apostolic. All I knew when I got born again was that I loved the church. I knew that I loved the church. When I got saved, actually God spoke to me. It wasn't audible, but it felt like it was audible. It was like on the inside when I got saved. And he said, if you're ever going to get out of this, and he was referring to my life of sin, like gross sin. And he said, if you're ever going to get out of this, you, he, didn't say, he didn't even say you need to come to me. You know what he said? You need to go back to church. That was the language he used for me. And then when I responded to that finally and was in church, I encountered him. And then when I encountered him, I got delivered and set free. I immediately fell in love with the church. Previous to that encounter, I had all sorts of mindsets about the church. Because there's all sorts of rubbish that the enemy loves to feed the world about the church. And people have opinions about the church. But when I had an encounter with love, with God himself, I fell in love with the church. And that makes sense because he's the head of the church and the church is his body. So if you don't love the church, there's probably something wrong in your heart. The church is not perfect because we're involved. (laughs) But we should never give up on the church. Jesus didn't give up on the church. He corrected the church, but he didn't give up on it. Paul, all of these people, there were things that were out of whack in certain points. And he, Paul even said to the Corinthian church, he said, there's sin amongst you that's not even heard of amongst the heathen. But he didn't say, you're, you're a compromised church. I'm not even worrying about you. He loved them and he cared for them. And that should be our heart for every church. Amen. No matter where they're at, what they're going through, we can never give up on the church. We love it. So if I look at my life, I know that I love the church, but it was interesting, Leo, I don't know if if this was the same for you, but God took me through a process of understanding the different aspects of church. And so at first, people told me, you must be an evangelist, because I just couldn't stop preaching the gospel. I'm out on the streets. Because like I, I didn't get an opportunity to stand behind this because I'm just a young, green Christian still learning. And I thought, I'm going to come to church awesome, but I want to bring everyone into this place. So every day I'm out on the streets. And so people said, you're an evangelist. And so for a while there, I thought maybe I'm an evangelist. And then there was a season where God led me to be in a home group that I didn't want to be in. But he spoke really clearly. He said, you need to go to that home group. And there was a prophet that was leading that home group. And so I didn't really sort of think about prophecy too much, a little bit on the streets, but I was more just about the gospel. But then I went through a season where there was an emphasis. God was teaching me about the prophetic. And so I'd be learning the prophetic and practicing the prophetic and starting to get strong in the prophetic under a prophet. And some people started to say, you must be a prophet because you're prophesying a lot. And so I was still learning who I was. I didn't know who I was. All I knew was I'm just a Christian. And I just sort of kept it real simple. I just want to look like Jesus. And then it was the same with the teacher anointing. I just, there was a season where I just started to labor in the Word and, and I really wanted to understand apologetics and doctrine. And, and I was just hours and hours and hours in the Word. And the same with um, the pastor. Then I, I was given an opportunity as part of my discipleship to lead a small group a Bible study group. And there I learned, I had a heart for really nurturing people. I realized we can't just be preaching the gospel on the streets or wherever we are. Um, 
and not having a place where they can have family, have connection. So I started to learn the importance of the pastoral. And so for 10 years, if I look back in hindsight, I can see God teaching me all these different elements to prepare me for the apostolic. So I think um, there are people in here, and you might not know what your call is yet, and that's okay. In the next session, I want to bring some scriptural understanding and bring some case studies scripturally about how do I know that I'm called to a particular office, and in particular, I'm going to use the, the apostle as, um, as the example, but we can apply the same principles to the other aspects in the next um, session. Does that sound all right? Yes. Awesome. Let's all stand to our feet. Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing this morning. I thank you for the freedom that was released. I thank you for the, the praise that's in our heart that was released, the, the, the demonic torment that was broken this morning, Father, the, the weighty presence and the freedom that was released, that you're setting things up. I thank you for last night laying the foundation with the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the importance of the fivefold ministry, Father. And I thank you for this morning's session and this next session, Lord God. I just pray our hearts continue to be open. And Lord God, I pray there'd be an impartation that some things would be taught um, this morning and today and even over this whole week, but other things would be just supernaturally caught. There'd be a, even without necessarily laying of hands, but just there'd be a stirring in our hearts for the different aspects. And there, if, if there's certain areas that we're called to, there'd, there'd be a fanning into flame, Lord God, which stir up that gift in us, Lord God. There's been an opportunity to stir up that gift to to uh, not be distracted. For some of us, there's going to be pruning, like there's areas that we're getting into that aren't our field. And God wants to um, uh, get us focused. I really believe a part of what we're doing right now is focusing. We can't all do everything. We're all, but if we, work, if we find our rightful place, God um, will be m most effective and amazingly effective for his glory. So I believe focus is a big part of it. So there'll be an impartation and a clarity about where to focus, what to focus in this current season that we're in, in our discipleship, that we wouldn't just be Christians that attend, but we'd be wholehearted followers, disciples of Jesus, Lord God, for your glory, for your glory in Jesus' name.